Hello and welcome to our session on speech on the internet, indecency and obscenity. As you pondered in our last lecture, have you ever wondered about what types of freedoms are enjoyed globally by citizens across the world? Have you ever considered the fact that there are so many freedoms enjoyed by citizens of the United States and those who come to call the US home that there are other countries where those freedoms are not necessarily enjoyed? Before we get into today's session, let's look at the video together that really magnifies the excesses that are happening at the level of the state where access and privileges are not necessarily enjoyed by other citizens around the world. So in essence, internet freedom is not necessarily the preserve of every single citizen that walks the planet, but in some cases, it's really not allowed in certain jurisdictions across the world due to the type of government. Not every country enjoys a democracy as the United States. So let's go now into today's session that really looks at what is happening in the context of speech on the internet, indecency, and obscenity. We know that the internet really emerged as a phenomenon in the late 90s, but even before that, there were certain things that were in place in terms of the, the restrictions um, on what was supposed to be aired across the broadcast spectrum in the United States. And of course, there were regulations governing those types of broadcasts. Now, specifically, I'm referring to the Federal Communications Commission or the FCC, that was actually formed by Congress in 1934 by the Communication Act to regulate communication channels as well as cables and the airwaves that we so enjoy. Now, the responsibilities of the Federal Communications Commission were, I would say, multi-layered. First, they were supposed to prevent monopolies in communications by making sure that no company has more than two stations. That is not happening right now. And of course, they were supposed to be involved in regulating content, including content considered to be obscene, indecent, and profane, which I referenced in our last lecture. All right. So they were also supposed to be looking into consumer complaints that pertain to communication services and content providers as well. The FCC was also really responsible for banning obscene material on the basis of the Miller's test that I referenced a couple of lectures ago. And so obscenity and profanity are what are known as protected speeches. And because of that, these are the safe harbor hours that the FCC implemented. For them, if there is any indecent and profane content, they must be broadcast beyond 10 p.m. So the safe harbor laws that were instituted really allowed the stations to broadcast between 6 a.m. and 10 p.m content that were known to be or expressly of a very moderate or I, I would say decent nature. So anything that was indecent or profane was prohibited between 6 a.m. and 10 p.m. when there is a reasonable risk that children may be a part of the audience within that particular window period of 6 a.m. and 10 p.m. This is the reason why you will see those particular types of um, notifications and ratings coming up Parental discussion is advised for movies and shows that are coming or there's some sort of content 
that is really deemed to be profane or indecent and not suitable for children's, um, I would say, consumption or viewing. Now, in the context of what the FCC deems to be indecent content and profanity, they describe indecent as content portraying sexual or excretory organs or activities that are in a way patently offensive to the audience. And profanity, basically, they felt that that content includes grossly offensive language that is considered a public nuisance. In other words, nobody wants to hear, because of the language, uh, what we call swear words. And this particular case that I'm going to bring up with you um, next on the slide really pertains to public nuisance um, that emerged as a case in the history of the FCC and, of course, um, you know, really banning the content. Now, for those of you who are familiar with this personality, the late George Carlin, the case of the FCC versus Pacifica Foundation pertained to the New York mid-afternoon radio broadcast of his monologue called Filthy Words. If you've ever come into contact with his content, you would know that it's filled with filthy words. It is what it is. It is a lot of expletives. And so that's how he expressed himself based on public satire. Um, I would say things around commentary of politics and economics. That was his persona when it came to his broadcast. So the public, his audience, were very used to this type of communication coming through his program, given its name, Filthy Words. And so a warning was ultimately issued by the station. Warning, audience members, sensitive language will be coming from this program, which might be regarded as offensive to some of you. So in many cases, you will find that stations are warning the audience before. Um, if we were to veer, I'm digressing slightly now, um, into the news, in some cases, you will find that the news reporter is actually saying, the announcer is saying, we warn you, we'd like to warn you that the content you're about to see may be sensitive. Um, recently with the, um, you know, not so distant past, the George Floyd case with the content, and of course, with the other issue um, where the, the, the nickels died, they will tell you in advance that the content you're about to see, it's very sensitive. So the warning that was issued by the station, let the public know, the audience members become aware that sensitive language was actually happening and that George Carlin's filthy words, um, the words were likely to be offensive to some of the audience members. Now, unbeknownst to the station, a parent from morality in media really filed the com you know the, the parent filed a complaint with the Federal Communications Commission on the basis that listen you're exposing my child my young child to content within those particular safe harbor hours now remember the safe harbor hours were supposed to be from the morning until 10 p.m. but there is George Carlin's program actually happening in the middle of the afternoon when there's supposed to be some sort of wholesome programming happening in the radio land. What the FCC did, they remanded Pacifica that was hosting the program and operated the station. And Pacifica in turn sued the FCC, claiming that they were infringing on the First Amendment rights of the producer, which was George Carlin, all right? Now, the lower courts agreed with Pacifica in terms of the First Amendment arguments, but the FCC took the matter higher. And where did they go? straight to the Supreme Court to interpret the Constitution once more. Now, there were some limited civil sanctions that could be constitutionally invoked against a radio station back then, based on patently offensive words dealing with sex and excretion, ex as they say, but not necessarily for those other filthy uh, words that were used by Carlin. Um, for the courts, the, the, the words need not be obscene to warrant sanctions, um, they were considering a couple of things, namely the audience, the medium, the time of day of the broadcast, and the method of transmission. For them, these were all relevant to determining whether to invoke sanctions against a particular radio station. And so when the commission finds that a pig has entered the parlor, and I quote, the exercise of its regulatory power does not depend on proof that a pig is actually obscene. So once there is a presence of obscenity, then they're going to issue sanctions against the station, all right? Now, the FCC's original jurisdiction, you would recall, if you were reading the document online, it really resided in radio, television, cable, and phone lines, 
but not extended to the internet until 2005. Remember, the internet came into being, into existence, just in the late 1990s, and after that, it was the wild, wild west. Everybody has some sort of program, and we have the information superhighway, and the FCC now has to extend its original jurisdiction. Now, on the President Obama, who took office around 2008, he ran for two terms. The internet was briefly designated as a utility, pretty much like we're using electricity and water and landline. It was seen as a necessity for us to actually remain interconnected and to communicate consistently. And so internet service providers had to deliver data to customers equally in the context of the arguments around net neutrality, meaning that I should not have to pay you more money because I want to access the information as my neighbor. As a service provider, you should give me some sort of equal footing financially for accessing the same information as the other customer and client. And so these arguments around net neutrality, you would have recalled, really pro um, progressed around the big companies like Comcast in terms of speed and consistency and Netflix and Xfinity. So all of these companies were competing with the customer base and you'll find that they had different markets and they were offering different products for the same internet service. And this is when there was this whole issue of how is this even net neutrality? Now, government has changed. And Trump appointee, Ajit Pai, he says, you know what? We're not even going to use this particular service that was called a utility as a utility. What he said was that no company violated the law when it came to this whole notion of net neutrality. He didn't find regulation to be necessary when he took office. So for, to do that is really to reverse what was actually put in place to protect the consumer, to protect you and to protect me from some sort of runaway train in the context of what was happening in net neutrality. And so what, you know, Pai was actually arguing is that, you know, if we if you have red likes and there's no accident and accidents occurring, then there's no need for the red likes, so to speak. All right. So this was really an argument that was baseless on the context of what was happening, politically speaking, where net neutrality and those particular stations were concerned or those Internet service providers were concerned. So the FCC has really historically taken a hands off approach to the Internet, which became widespread by the late 1990s. And of course, it became a very lawless realm or platform where everybody was using every particular profanity and all sorts of content was being uploaded. Now, the case I'd like to draw your attention to is Stratum Oakman Inc. versus Prodigy Services Company of 1995 and backpedaling in 1994, an anonymous user posted some unflattering comments about Stratum Oakman. And of course, they were actually not necessarily in favor of the comments and they moved to actually file a lawsuit um, against that um, internet service provider, so to speak, all right? Um, so the allegation is that Stratum Open was involved in criminal and fraudulent activities. And of course, those allegations were found to be truthful eventually. But they went ahead and they sued for defamation and they were asking for $100 million in damages and they named Prodigy as the defendant due to the anonymity of the user. Now, today people are usually showing their hands, they're showing who they are, but there's still some degree of anonymity that occurs at the level of those internet service providers who have people who will be posting comments. I'm sure some of us have posted comments in our lifetime and we've not necessarily put our names. And so that shroud of secrecy still exists as it relates to who has access to the internet and who makes claims against companies or people. But you have people who are now very much, you know, removing the veil and they're, you know, making allegations. But once those allegations are found to be truthful, then of course the court will strike down the, the lawsuit and stuff like that. That does not stop the particular internet service provider from being cited. But for this context here, the Stratum Oakman case, they were suing for $100 million against Prodigy, which was actually the host. Now, in their defense, what the host said is that we're not the author. Why are you shooting us? We are not the messenger. All right. We are just really giving the message. Shoot the messenger. We should not be held liable for what our users post on our servers. That was their particular defense. And they're basically saying that we are a library 
with books. We don't know what's inside of the books. So do not shoot us down. All right. Um, the ruling really, <laughs> what the court said when they consider this case is that Prodigy were the moderators of the discussion board. And so they should have enforced some guidelines on the use of foul language or anything that is happening to go out there, in this case, defamation. Um, the court also said that if you're actually acting as a publisher, like a newspaper, you're supposed to have staff who can actually be scurrying, um, staff who can actually be um, checking or censoring the content, such as an editorial team is responsible for. Now, again, the implications here that emerged with this 1995 case is that are we calling internet service providers now content moderators? There are some critics that emerged, and of course, Justice Inge's decision would force online service providers um, you know, to actually choose between two what we call odious paths. Are we going to screen every single person who comes up there to make a post, or are we going to just monitor messages? Are we going to just avoid doing the monitoring altogether? So we either take the moral side of screening, or we just allow people to do as they please on the internet. That paved the way really for Prodigy losing the case. And of course, strategy, um, Stratum, they, they, they agreed to remove this $100 million um, lawsuit in exchange for a public apology, all right? Now, bear in mind, the reason why Prodigy lost the case, it's because what the courts were saying is that if you have an internet service that you're offering and you're not monitoring what's going out there, then you're actually not indemnified from a lawsuit as a result of not putting those checks and balances in place. Because if somebody goes out there and they call your name and they're not right with what they have said and they've cost you, um, whether it's emotionally or, you know, through some sort of a loss of employment, then you're supposed to be held liable. All right. Now, the precedent here is that <laughs> Silicon Valley really came into being as a result of the need now for Internet service providers to protect themselves from what was going to come later on. All right. Now, Congress included what we call the Communication Decency Act Section 230 to give some sort of immunity to internet service providers for user-generated content. Anonymity and all of these different cloaks that people are hiding under, it will be deemed as user-generated content, not by the service provider, but those who are actually there on the site using it. So what they started to do, they started to moderate language and other decency-related content without being considered the publishers of the content using Section 230 of the 1996 Communication Decency Act. Further, really what the act did, it provided immunity for interactive service providers for content posted by others. And I'm laughing, not um, you know, in any way funny, but I'm thinking about Twitter and all of the, the different things that have transpired during the former administration under Trump, where there was this whole notion of, let us tweet here, there, and everywhere, and let us do whatever we need to do uh, because we have the First Amendment, all right? And so states that voluntarily moderated, um, they were not invalidated in terms of the immunity. So immunity for interactive service providers was actually guaranteed under Section 230 of the 1996 Communication Decency Act. Now, the tripartite immunity test is what was actually um, established to protect internet service providers. And what the, the tripartite test basically held is that the defendant must be a provider or user of an interactive computer service. The cause of harm asserted by the plaintiff in this particular case must view the defendant as the publisher or speaker of the harmful information at issue. And thirdly, the information must be provided by another information content provider that is, the defendant must not be the information content provider of the harmful information at issue. It basically means that these, these particular um, elements, these aspects of the test will protect the internet service provider uh, once they're not necessarily the persons who are uh, producing the content. So somebody else is on your back door, somebody else is in your car, you're on the highway, but you're just actually transporting the person. And so this is what um, was required for them to pass the tripartite immunity test, so to speak. 
Now, without Section 230, you will find that social media platforms like Twitter, you know, Instagram, Facebook, you know, TikTok, they would not exist as a result of not having these particular, I would say, privileges extended to them. Six, Section 230 of the Communication Decency Act also protects platforms that are used for hate speech and platforms that are used by extremists to skew their ideologies. And we know that this happened um, in a case a couple of years ago where um, one mass shooter actually used a chan to talk about not liking particular groups of people or immigrant groups of people. And his hate speech was actually um, downloaded and captured after he committed the particular heinous crime. So I'd like you to just read how do you solve a problem like you know a chain there's no need for you to weigh in because we don't have a discussion board so just read that and you will see exactly how it is that section 230 has really been um i would say party to the wanton types of messages that will go up there that are not necessarily monitored things have changed significantly since then um there is much more monitoring happening right now with content um, we know that, you know, Zuckerberg has been made to answer some questions and stuff like that. And so a lot of the content service providers um, are there answering questions and they've got to be able to monitor users. All right. Later on, I'll come to this whole notion of the Knight Institute versus Trump um, and the, 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 the ways in which they were actually looking at the content that were posted, the content posted during his administration and the fact that he was attempting to actually block content. Um, I will share with you a brief video as well, an excerpt from the current owner. Um, these were comments that he made before he actually took over Twitter, but we'll come to that very shortly. I'd like to turn our attention to, I would say, what were some of the battles, the struggles that occurred between the you know successive attorneys general and the American Civil Liberties Union in the context of decency and online content. Now, criminalized content were deemed as content seen to be obscene, obscene or indecent rather, and of course, content that were, you know, not pr promoting decency and were found against uh, minors, these were criminalized by the um, federal administration. It was supposed to be something that the FCC was looking at very closely, all right? Again, the FCC did not really bring the internet under its purview until very late. And so obscenity and indecency were there across the internet at wanton. It was really accessible to anyone, including children. And so that's the reason why the former Attorney General, Janet Reno, who was the Attorney General in 1997, she took the American Civil Liberties Union to task in court to fight the whole notion of why do we have children exposed to indecent content on the internet. Um, so the intentional transmission of messages and information which depicts or describes sexual or excretory activities or organs in a manner deemed offensive by community standards, these were all supposed to be criminalized content, not supposed to actually um, be broadcast online. And so Reno really um, was fighting and they were saying that, you know, you, you're actually having this sort of unfiltered type of content in such a way um, that children are exposed repeatedly to pornography, all right? That's what you saw on the internet, and it was really offensive to the public. Um, the American Civil Liberties Union counteracted, all right? And they said that some sections of the Communication Decency Act were not constitutional under the First Amendment, and the, Janet, the, the, the then Attorney General, uh, Janet Reno, it's not Jane, her name was Janet Reno. Um, she lost the case in the lower courts and she went straight to the Supreme Court. You guessed right, Supreme Court. So what the Supreme Court argument was, basically, they said that the Communication Decency Act violated the First Amendment because its regulations amounted to a content-based blanket restriction of the freedom of speech. Bear in mind, a couple of lectures ago, I spoke about those content-based or content-neutral restrictions of free speech. Now we're talking about decency versus indecency. And of course, the Supreme Court is applying the content-based restriction of free speech on issues around pornography. 
again, they're weighing in on indecency and they're saying that indecent communications is not clearly defined and it's therefore vague. So if you have excretory organs, excretory, 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 excretory you know, I'm getting tongue tied here, but if you have all the private parts out there and kids are exposed to those particular excesses, then it was really found to be indecent based on the argument. But the courts argued in, in, in response that what is what what are you calling indecent? It's very vague to us. And so failure to limit restrictions to a particular time or individuals, uh, they deemed the action to be overbroad. All right. Um the courts further argue that using the Miller's test, you know, the First Amendment really distinguishes between indecent and obscene sexual expressions and protecting only, um, I would say, things that were in the context of obscene. And, um, you know, they kept arguing all the time about indecency and they struck down most of the Communication Decency Act, Section 230, except for child pornography. Now, there are some implications following that because what happened is that the Congress came back with this whole notion of let's talk about this issue again. All right. We're going to bring up what we call the Child Online Protection Act or COPA of 1998. By then, we have another attorney general, John Ashcroft, in office, and he's gone back again to fight with the American Civil Liberties Union. And they were using what? The Miller's test again to define obscenity. Content considered harmful to minors is what they said was deemed to be obscene, all right? The content was not age appropriate. And of course, they define harmful as communication, picture, images, graphic files. That is really kind of obscene. I'd like to bring your memory back to or turn your attention back to this whole notion of the court saying that it is vague to call whatever it is obscene without defining. So this is when they actually came up with a definition. It's a communication, picture, image, or graphic. Anything with people's parts, private parts outside, it is just purely obscene. Of course, this was Ashcroft's argument in 2002. Further, by defining harmful to minors as obscene and by using the Supreme Court's definition, Congress passed an ironclad legislation. At least they thought so, all right? Enter the American Civil Liberties Union again. They took the government to the Supreme Court and John Ashcroft, he's been losing. And of course, his name appears as a plaintiff and they did not have any success. Congress had, you know, Congress had not yet met its burden to show that the um, particular, you know, protections requirements were more effective than other methods of preventing minors from exposure. And of course, some adults may not have credit cards. All of the issues around children and access were raised in the court and, you know, questions of the Communication Decency Act and the, the different ways in which they wanted to actually invoke the types of regulations, the Child Online Protection Act, and, you know, and it returned in 2002. They were saying you're out of order because this is really First Amendment and stuff like that. All right. So the court heard this particular case three times, 2002, 2007, and 2009 as the government tried to prove that the Child Online Protection Act is effective, they failed at every single turn from protecting the children from exposure to what was known as lewd content, all right? So that particular act was actually struck down and that's the reason why we have pornography. Um, anybody can access pornography at any time. And so this is where you will find porn hubs and all of these sites. Um, in some cases, I think offices and institutions um, will restrict access. Parents can attempt to restrict access, but um, there are quite a few cases that happened to, to, to have emerged after in the context of this particular freedom that was won by the American Civil Liberties Union where porn is concerned and the content online. Now, this particular case here, Packingham versus North Carolina of 2017, um, Packingham was really convicted of taking indecent liberties with a minor in 2002 as a 21-year-old college student. At that time, Packingham was 21 years old, and he was actually, you know, dealing with somebody who was probably under the age of 16, considered to be a minor. And he served his time. He was sentenced to about a year imprisonment and, of course, 24 month, a 24-month period of supervised release. So, um, you know, he was supposed to remain away from minors with no special stipulations 
I'm saying all of this to say to you that the interpretation now of indecent liberties was applied to the internet in this particular case of Packingham versus North Carolina. Let's see how it actually evolved. So he was arrested in 2010 for Facebook posts, basically thanking God for having a parking ticket dismissed. <laughs> it was argued that the post violated North Carolina's laws regarding convicted sex offenders. Of course, we know that when somebody's convicted, the entire neighborhood knows that that's a sex offender in the neighborhood and stuff like that. All right. It barred sex offenders access to social media websites. But the court found that the state had a weighty interest in keeping sexual predators off social media for the protection of minors. He was not necessarily browsing to look for minors. He was basically making a simple post about being happy about not having to pay the parking ticket. So he appealed all the way to the Supreme Court. He said that the North Carolina laws was unconstitutional. The law was unconstitutional as it violated his right to speak on a simple matter. I'm happy that I was not given a parking ticket. All right. Now, what happened? The decision. Social media, like the modern public squares or spheres, right? Public forum doctrine. The court said, if social media is an open space, why are you blocking somebody from actually being a part of the public sphere or the public sphere? All right. The court also said that while the government has a compelling interest to prevent child abuse, the North Carolina law went too far because it encompassed websites that were unlikely to facilitate sex crimes against a child. So there was an over breath in terms of how the court applied the use of social media against Packingham in this particular instance. All right. So the significance here is that, you know, social media was designated as a public forum. If you think about starry decisis and the precedented sets, and of course, it sought to demonstrate the significance of the case in the sense that we're going to turn our attention to the next case that has to do with Trump and the Knight First Amendment Institute. So President Trump really <laughs> had a field day on Twitter, like other presidents. I think that President Obama really also um, grew his his base on, 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 on social media as well. But Trump in particular, his case is important because he was taken to task by the Knight First Amendment Institute in the sense that when he tweeted and somebody else was tweeted who was not necessarily in agreement, he thought to block them. All right. If you're following these particular cases, you would know that he frequently blocked opposition voices. Um, eventually, there were things that were given out there. There were different bits and pieces of tweets that were not necessarily factual, and that led eventually to him being removed from the platform. Quite a few persons were removed from the platform as a result of their types of tweets and stuff like that in the, in a, in, in the confines of what we would have deemed to be unprotected speech. All right. Now, prior to the incident, Knight could not have sued the president since Twitter is a private company, still a private company, changed hands recently, owned now by Elon Musk. And of course, the First Amendment does not apply to private entities based on the state action doctrine, state action doctrine. So citing Packingham as precedent, Knight actually sued the president. And, you know, <laughs> the argument is that he was placing some sort of content based restriction on people who were responding to his tweets. And he was not supposed to have done that. Um, because he was operating on a free space, all right? The Second Circuit Court of Appeals, they ruled that Trump conducts official business on Twitter and he cannot block users on the basis of their opinion. And they compel him to unblock every single person that he was actually blocking on Twitter. It's a good example of checks and balances of those who are in authority, as we spoke about. Now, let me share with you what Musk was actually saying just before this whole thing occurred in the context of um, what was happening um, and the ban and stuff like that. He did say that he was not in agreement with the ban and that he was going to actually reinstate. And that was actually that, that has actually occurred since the changing of, of the guard in terms of who now owns Twitter. Let's watch. Uh. It was not correct to ban Donald Trump. I think that was that was a mistake um, because it uh, it 
alienated a large part of the country and did not ultimately result in Donald Trump not having a voice. I, I guess the answer is that I, 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 I would reverse the perma ban. I would say I'm not, I don't own Twitter yet, so this is not like a thing that will definitely happen because what if I don't own Twitter? If, if there are tweets that are wrong, they should and bad, those should be uh, uh, either deleted or made invisible. Um, and a suspension, uh, a temporary suspension is appropriate, um, but not a permanent ban. It was a fun, I, th I think it was a morally bad decision, to be clear, and, and foolish in the extreme. I'm, I'm sure most of you are aware that Mosk is now the owner, and what has happened as a result of his ownership, there has been a mass, I would say, evacuation, a mass exodus or Trexit. Um, including, you know, persons who are reporters, uh, some persons who were actors and actresses. Um, you know, a lot of people have left the platform as a result of those checks and balances that are now put in place um, as a result of their presence on Twitter. All right. So quite a lot has happened since. And this is in the context of what should and should not transpire online in the context of social media platforms and there are quite a few other videos that I'd like to encourage you to look at as it relates to how uh, the internet, how privately owned platforms are actually eroding the freedoms or they're allowing excesses to the detriment of the society. Now, for your readings for this week, I'd like for you to actually make sure that you are clicking on the hyperlinks here. These should lead you directly to the court matters and the readings, including how do you solve a plot problem, um, you know, Reno versus the African American um, Civil Liberties Union, and of course, Ashcroft versus Free Speech. I've checked all of these links, and you should be able to click on these hyperlinks, and they will lead you directly to the case briefs for the respective areas. So I trust that you found this um, week's sessions to be informative. I hope that you don't find the lectures that are here to be repetitive. They're not meant to be repetitive. They're meant to complement the slides rather than just give you the slides and you're not aware of what are the implications or the uh, reasonings or the background of these particular modules. This is the reason why I'm actually taking the time to make sure that I prepare the lectures for you. As always, I would love to hear from you. Um, if you have any issues or concerns, reach out to me via email so that I can actually amend as I go along and help you to make sure that you're absorbing these first modules that pertain to communication law. We are moving very soon to the ethical dimensions of the course, so I'd like for you to make sure that you are there, you're with me, and that you're giving me feedback. I know that you do have some assignments that are upcoming, and I'm going to be actually in touch to make sure that everyone is on track with the course. So I will see you next time.